Leanne Hepburn, mic one, testing. Jonathan Worrell, Life Sciences. Jonathan Worrell, Life Sciences. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our professorial inaugural lectures. I'm Maria Fasli. I'm the executive dean for the Faculty of Science and Health and the professor in the School of Computer Science and Electronic Engineering. It's wonderful to have all of you with us tonight, both in person as well as those watching us via our YouTube live stream. I have to offer the apologies of Professor Chris Greer our Pro Vice Chancellor Research, who couldn't be um, here with us tonight because he has been taken uh, ill, but he sends his best regards and he's really sorry he cannot join us. So I'm gonna be your master mistress of ceremonies for tonight. So um, since the university was founded in 1964, we have remained equally committed to excellence in both education and research for the benefit of individuals and communities. Over the past 60 years, 
Our academics have produced work which has inspired whole generations and helped establish Essex's reputation for research in the UK and globally. This research ranges from pioneering work on poverty and in inequality by Professor Peter Townsend to the development of the world's first publicly available computer language by Professor Tony Brooks, Brooker, one of the founding professors of computer science. We continue to push the boundaries of research today, from promoting human rights around the world to pioneering the use of big data in developing countries. Since 2013, our professorial inaugural lecture series has showcased our world-class research with more than 60 lectures across a wide range of topics, including the laws of war, inequality and mortality, and the future of reparations for victims of mass atrocities. These lectures are, are a true highlight of our academic year. They give us a chance to come together to celebrate the world leading research talent here at the University of Essex and the successes of our colleagues. Having Professor Sandercock, Professor Hepburn, and Professor Worrell with us here tonight means you will have the chance to hear from three outstanding academics from the Faculty of Science and Health. The University of Essex consistently ranks in the UK's research elite. The international quality of our research was recognized by the government's most recent, most research, recent research excellence framework with five of our departments in the Faculty of Science and Health in the top 30 for research power in their fields, including sports and exercise sciences and biological sciences. The Faculty of Science and Health brings together six academic departments and schools, together with a further seven research centers and institutes that make diverse contribution to the university's strategic mission as a globally competitive, research intensive, and student focused institution. With research specialisms and impact in health, life sciences, psychology, artificial intelligence, robotics, mathematics, and big data, our strategy is to ensure that our research and education activities are mapped onto national and international research priorities. Many of our staff have strong links to relevant industries and organizations, from the NHS to technology companies. From understanding how to combat antibiotic resistance, to using microbes to clean up pollution, from new cancer therapies to developing better crops, from promoting health across the lifespan to helping elite athletes improve performance, at Essex, our cutting edge research addresses inequalities and improves lives. Across our three faculties, our community of more than 800 Essex researchers are change makers, innovators, and free thinkers. They pose bold questions, tackle real world problems, shape thinking, and influence policy. These professorial inaugural lectures are designed to inspire and perhaps challenge through the celebration of research excellence. You'll see all of our qualities of our unique Essex research mindset demonstrated by the world-class academics speaking here tonight. After the lecture, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. And then you will be very welcome to join us for a drinks reception where you'll have the opportunity to speak to our professors, but also to each other. Our first professor this evening is Professor Gavin Sandercock from the School of Sport, Rehabilitation and Exercise Sciences, otherwise known as ESRES within the university. The school has a proven track record of excellence in teaching, research, and applied sports science. They are 23rd in the UK for research power in sport, exercise sciences, leisure, and tourism. Their research reflects a diverse range of interests with staff working across four research clusters, conducting world-leading research in sport, rehabilitation, exercise, and health. The research is not just about academic excellence, though. 
It has impact encompassing individuals, teams, groups, organizations, communities, and the wider society, using its state-of-the-art facilities for research and education. The research clusters support all members to produce significant original and rigorous research, promote knowledge exchange between cluster members, and enhance research collaborations within and beyond ESRES and the wider university. Professor Gavin Sandercock is a professor in sport and exercise science and director of research output for ESRES. He originally studied psychology and PE at Chester College, then completed an MSc in nutrition from the University of Liverpool. Gavin then worked for the Ministry of Defense as a teaching fellow and as a personal trainer before starting his PhD at Brunel University in 2002. He came to Essex in 2006 to teach clinical physiology and cardiac rehabilitation. From 2007 to 2012, he led the East of England Healthy Heart Study, highlighting falls in English children's, in English children's fitness and including the only objective evaluation of the 2012 Olympic legacy by assessing the effects on children's fitness. He has sat on select committees and scientific advisory groups focused on childhood obesity, physical activity, and health in the UK, and also collaborated on research internationally with colleagues in Saudi Arabia, Tanzania, North America, Portugal, and Colombia. Gavin is also director of testing at Fit Media Fitness, through which he helps design bespoke assessment and evaluation programs for schools and other organizations, allowing them to obtain high quality evidence to evaluate efficacy of curriculum changes and interventions such as PE Premium and the Daily Mile. Gavin is a qualified level uh, four cardiac rehabilitation exercise instructor, retired, sorry, five, uh, retired from Ironman, a retired Ironman, not from Ironman, and certified tough guy. I'm really keen to find out what this is. <laughs> Professor Gavin Sandercook, the floor is yours. So no pressure then, thank you. Right, okay, so uh, that bloke up there used to be me. <laughs> and that's what I am now. So thank you and welcome to you all. Uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of what we, uh, what I tend to call edutainment, what most lectures tend to be. Now, so you need to know a little bit of the background of the science of what I do in order to uh, uh, get the in jokes. Right. So I'm going to talk really about aerobic fitness. You can take aerobic out of that. Think about fitness stamina, ability to run, being as fit as a butcher's dog, being wh whatever you like. There are four things that affect that. Three things we can do nothing about, our genetics, what sex we are, what age we are, and one thing that we can do a lot about, and that's how active we are. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So there is a little bit of science in this. Sorry about that. There's when I talk about fitness, I'm going to talk about metabolic equivalence. I'm just going to say METs. You are now at one and a bit METs. A MET is your metabolic rate times whatever need you have of it. Sitting down, 1.1 METs. Sleeping, 1 MET. Standing here, quite stressed and pooing myself a bit. Uh, probably about three and a half METs. But, uh, and running, running upstairs, nine or ten METs. So the, the more METs you have, the, uh, or the more METs you're working at, the, the, the harder you're working. And in case anyone from humanities came in, I've kept the graphs simple. Uh, so I haven't put any units on them. Um, anyone from humanities? No, anyway. Uh, and it's quite obvious that the more active you are, the fitter you get. And the good thing about fitness is there's no upper limit. You can be, the more active you get, the fitter you get. Get more active, get more fit. Get more active, get more fit. It's dead easy. 
There's no sweet spot. There's, it's just the more the better. And as my sponsor says, every little helps. So we call this a simple dose response. This is a linear dose response. And I'll come back to this. I will say these words again and again, dose response, because it's pretty simple. We teach this to the first years in sport and exercise science. Most of them are hungover. They're wearing shorts and slides. And they get it. So if you lot don't, then I'm out of a job. Right. So the good thing about this, is we also know how big the dose response is in terms of uh, uh, health. If you increase your fitness by a met, so if you can get your fitness up by a met, and if you get your fitness up by a met by doing 20 minutes walking a day extra, you can reduce your premature mortality, not, not absolute mortality, by about 12%. So that's a nice big dose response. So when we started this, when I started here, as Maria said, I started off not as a sports scientist. I started off as a clinical exercise physiologist in cardiology. Sounds a lot more glorious, but anyway, I'm a sports scientist now. So um, we started off doing exercise, looking at cardiac rehabilitation. And this should have been like shooting fish in a barrel because there's evidence-based guidelines in cardiac rehabilitation from NICE, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, that told us how to prescribe exercise, dose, and how to assess fitness, response. So I've got my two lines on my graph. All I've got to do is put them together dead easy. However, the evidence that we were working from, or that the... Um, the cardiac rehab centers that we were working with. We were one here. I used to run it. As I said, I am an instructor. I can count to eight and everything because that's what, that's what I used to do. <laughs> <laughs> I only did a PhD because I wanted to count to nine. But the, the evidence was that there was a 19% reduction in five-year mortality. Now, the problem if you run a cardiac rehab center and you want to show it works is you can't wait five years to see if someone dies to see if you're doing any good. It's not very nice. You go, hello, is he dead yet? No, he's not dead. All right, okay, fine. Next year, is he, it doesn't work. So we said that well, the easiest way to do this would be to look at fitness. Does your cardiac rehab improve fitness? And when we looked at the evidence again, a couple of my brilliant MSc students uh, who are watching online, hopefully, they better be, uh, showed that it does. It went up by 1.6 mets. So there's a little bit of maths in this. So 1.6 mets increase in fitness, and every met increase reduces risk of mortality by 12%. So 12% times 1.6 equals 19. Et voila. Everyone happy? Brilliant. Except there's no UK data available. All the data came from Europe and the States. And I had worked previously in the NHS, or uh, well I'd been in the NHS doing do data collection, and I had noticed that actually what they did wasn't quite the same as what the guidelines were saying. Because exercise is not a black box. It's not like a, a beta blocker or a, an ACE inhibitor. It's not a drug. You can't just take a drug trial from America, take that drug, give it to people in England and get the same effect. You have to do the same thing. In America, they were doing a lot more exercise than they were in the UK. There were no data, so what do you do? Well, if you're young and stupid like I was, then you go out and you get it. So that's what we did. We got 1,000 patients, and we looked at how much their uh, fitness changed during cardiac rehab. Oh, it doesn't pull up good. So, and we looked at seven UK centers, six UK, sorry, six UK centers, and we saw, oh, this, this improves, this improves, this improves, this improves, but not much. Look at the number there. It's supposed to be this much. It was only this much. Why was it this much? If you've been paying attention, it's because of the dose response. They were doing about a third of the exercise. They were getting, so they're giving a third of the dose. They get a third of the response. It's like giving someone a third of a drug. Cracking the, cracking the pill in half, 
and then, well, no, sorry, track it and put it in thirds, and then, I told you, not from maths, but, uh, and then giving it to them. And that's exactly what we would expect, exactly what we would predict. Now, <laughs> fair to say it didn't go down well. Um, so I thought, well, if I'm going to make enemies, let's make proper enemies. So we said, well, at the moment in the UK, you, you're basing your evidence on a 36-session dose, because that's what was... That's how this came about over here. They did 36 sessions. In the UK, the average patient got 12. You've done a third of what they should get, and you've got a third of what they should get out of it. Easy. So there's a solution, isn't there? Do, do three times more. Okay. 33% dose, 33% response. Public enemy, number one. Here we go. Now, they all say that... that, that they all say, don't leave the podium... Uh, they will say that, <laughs> that the, the, the truth is hard to stomach, right, sometimes. And it, it is. But sometimes it's so obvious. And I, I don't mean to demean my undergraduate students, but they do, you know, come in hungover and they do, you know, they have better things to do than listen to me talk. They've got rugby to play. They've got, you know, all these other things. They get this. So why couldn't the NHS get it? So they didn't believe that what we'd shown in our trial was true. So we took their data and fed it back to them. And this made me even less popular. So we have a weird, a weird, uh, a strange bit of extrapolation to go through, go through here. That, so this was a meta-analysis that one of my, uh, again, another pair of brilliant students did. And the, the blob is the size of the, the trial. And the, obviously, the number of sessions they do is on here. And how much uh, change in fitness you get is up here. The journal would let us extrapolate this far. 32 sessions. And at 32 sessions, we were, well, we're 1.4 met. But as you can see, most cardiac centers in the UK were only down here, 10, 12. So, I don't try to make problems. I try to give solutions. And I thought I was trying, this is the law of unintended consequences, trying to create leverage to help these people get more funding, get more money to do better services. Didn't work. Um, so we said, well, on average, you're creating a change in 0.45 mets. We would guess that you are having a 4% effect on mortality. Of course, no one measures this. If we extrapolated further than any mathemat mathematician would let you, we said, well, actually, if you did 36 sessions, you would get exactly 19%. That's where you would get that. You're doing the right thing. You're just not doing enough of it. Ask for more money, get more funding, and you'll be there. No. Right. So, public enemy number one. They say that people, that a third of academic papers aren't read by anyone. This academic paper was clearly not read before they invited me to their national conference. So they chased me out of uh, the uh, Excel Center, NHS lanyards flapping in the wind, and I also realized that actually most of them aren't very fit anyway, so I outran them and disappeared. Now, I was public enemy number one only for one year until a big trial was actually published uh, looking at mortality, which is the weirdly the uh, measure of health that doctors understand uh, and it showed that actually our four percent was a massive overestimation cardiac rehab in the uk doesn't have any benefit chris said keep it light that's not very light is it right let's go on to something lighter so giving up on older adults that we gotta stay here sorry we went on to the other, my other my other track was to look at fitness in in children so the idea being here that if we look at that dose response again and we look at health and fitness again for the humanities, uh, but I have a BA by the way, so I'm allowed to say that. Uh, we have higher fitness, better health, lower fitness, poorer health. And it's pretty linear. There is no limit to being fit. You can be fitter and fitter and fitter and you'll be healthier and healthier and healthier. If we also look at 
fitness as a proxy for physical activity. It's a bit more complicated because it's got like a slight bendy bit in it. And it's also got some confidence intervals around it. So very, some people are very lucky. They can be very inactive. They can do nothing and be quite fit. So there's a bit of noise down here. But if you ever watch the Olympics and you watch all the athletes that finish, they finish within a tenth of a second of each other because there's not a limit to fitness. So everyone who's very active is very much the same, and they're also very healthy. Now, the good news about children, believe it or not, if you just ignore what the, uh, the press say, is that most children are very healthy. The problem with children being healthy is there's nothing to look at if you look at the, uh, at the data. So what we were doing was using fitness as a proxy for health. So what did we do? Well, a couple of things. Oh, sorry, forgot. You don't even get a bend in the curve till you're exercising more than 12 hours a week. Anyone exercising 12 hours a week? Please stand up. There you go. Right. So, it, you have to skip over certain things when you're doing these, uh, when you're doing 18 years in 20 minutes. Uh, so, <laughs> um, I'm going to skip over what happened and what we showed and, and amalgamate a couple of studies. So if anyone's really spotting online, yeah, this wasn't all one study. We looked at, when we look at fitness in children, we have to, we have to normalize it because children have this annoying habit of growing. And they get bigger and they get older and they change and they get fitter. So we just normalize it so that in this case, zero, Z zero is expected and anything above Z is, Z zero is better than expected and anything below Z0 is worse than expected. And this is what we found for fitness. First of all, there, started off in 1998, right up there, above expected. This is UK, this is actually Chelmsford kids, all the way down in 2015 to a huge drop. At the same time, because we knew someone would ask us this question, oh, is it because they've got fatter? No, they haven't got fatter. They were always fat. Uh, and they've stayed fat, and they haven't, they've got a bit fatter, but not much fatter. They had got bigger, however. Kids have got bigger, right? You look at these two here, they, they're, mine, they're mine, there you go, embarrass you now. Right, so th they got bigger. The girls were two centimeters taller. They're going through puberty for nearly a year earlier than they were in 1998. Um, so they've got bigger, and if you've got bigger, you don't need to be a sport and exercise scientist to know that big people are strong. The bigger you are, the stronger you are. So if they've got bigger, they should have got stronger. No, they got weaker. Children are literally not made of the same stuff they were in 1998 because they're bigger, but they are more and more flimsy. Mine aren't, mine are great, but they're more and more flimsy. And they're weaker, they're weaker and less fit, but they're bigger. That tells me that something's going on. Now, I was I said, lucky enough, and Vicky's not here, unfortunately. Vicky Paskin from the, the um, uh, comm center prostituted me out to every me media outlet you've ever seen. And, I've, and anyone else appeared live on Al Jazeera. There you go. So I thought it was a type of copy. But anyway, so we, we, we 200 media outlets around the world, this all went global. It went, we'd now say it went viral. I'm going to just share one with you, though. However, you know you've hit the zeitgeist when you hit the, the gossip column of the Times. Do you know, you know who that is? That Robert Crampton. Right, right. And you may be wondering why it's called Fitness versus Fatness in a Bent Carrot Romp. If anyone likes anagrams, you'll be there already. <laughs> I mean, we had front pages, we had everything, but this was just my favorite because he just said, anyway, Dr. Gavin Sadikot sounds painful. Why do, <laughs> <laughs> Why do these people always have, do these studies always have names? Yeah, Dr. Mickle, right? You know, we know silly names. We don't, right, that sound as if they were blank, blank, blank. And if anyone doesn't ask me that question later, then you can have it. <laughs> so... It's a bent current romp because that's an anagram of his name. And that was every time I replied to him on Twitter, I just claimed dyslexia and called him that. Anyway, I would never go that low. Right, so 
Meanwhile, we were testing out a way of doing mass screening using fitness testing. Some of the things we did were pretty obvious. We looked at how active kids were and looked at the fitness of the 10,000 that we measured across 14 schools. We did it for school travel. We did it for sedentary behavior, looking at screens, did it for nutrition. But there's something that all of these things have in common. They're all rules. If you're a kid, they're all rules, and they come from parents. And we also look directly at parental engagement and how active kids were with their parents. And these are the two I'm going to focus on very quickly. So, on the other hand, hang on, yeah, yeah, I nearly gave my punchline away. So, oh, I hate not being able to walk. <laughs> so, the other thing that we did, this bit's the easy, as a, as a sport and exercise scientist, doing this bit, testing the fitness is fine. Getting in the, inside the minds of teenagers, that's something else. We piloted everything. We did it wrong first before we did it right. And now I'm going to show you some of the responses we got to the questions we didn't use. So, you might think we were asking for it when we did some of this. So, so okay, I, I am assured by the teacher that that says walking. But I'm not a hundred percent sure. This is that was a year that was a year uh, eight, uh, sorry year ten boy. This is a year nine girl below. Um, tell us about. I know we're asking for it again, but her response was good. <laughs> I love it. Fourteen years. Good quality, not just sex. Good quality sex. Excellent. Right. Never give them too much space. So you think that that's pretty. That's pretty. You know. It's a quite a nice just response, isn't it? And then, and for, for my mum sat there, this is for you, Ma. Other than homework, what do you spend time doing online? Your mum. There you go. So, despite that noise, we managed to get some decent responses out of most of the 10,000 kids. I have 100 of these. If anyone wants to spend an hour, buy me a beer, I'll, I'll give you the lot. Um, uh, very concentrated in South Essex, oddly. But anyway, so we looked at parental associations. And now this is an odd one. So a bit of science. Let's do a bit of science. So here we have how fit the child is up, up the uh, uh, y-axis here. And then we have, the first of all, the association with the mother. Now, you, you will now guess why we never asked the question, how fit's your mum, right? Because that would have been just, would have been dead, Yeah. So we didn't ask how fits your mum. We asked what does you, no, we asked how active is you, how do you act. Why do we ask about your mum? Well, because you inherit your aerobic fitness from your mother, yes? Almost uniquely, because it's passed through mitochondrial DNA. So it comes down the matriarchal line. So if you want to be successful in, as an athlete, you want a fit mum, <laughs> as it were. However, <laughs> you... So we have this, this gradient here, but we also have an I I almost identical, nearly as strong gradient for fathers, which just shows that the sociological effect is just as strong for fathers as well. The last thing that we did was we, we looked at the differences, not just by mother and father, et cetera, et cetera. We looked at it by how, wh when you're born, because when you're born matters. So... This wasn't, what, this wasn't planned, but we found that even if we corrected for everything else, the kids born, kids, lucky kids, born due to a power cut, due to the Middle East Electricity Board in 1972, were fitter. Which just goes to show you that you can stand on the shoulder of giants because you can take a simple idea, like, hang on, sorry, I'm out of time, to say, as Bertrand Russell said, choose your parents wisely. Stand on the shoulder of giants, said, yes, choose your parents wisely, but only let them have sex at Christmas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sandra, for this truly enlightening presentation. Um, 
you should have told me about the link between mothers and aerobic activity much earlier in my life, too late now. Uh, though I would not change my mother for anything in the world, I have to say. So our next professor to speak this evening is Professor Leanne Keburn from the School of Life Sciences. The University of Essex School of Life Sciences is one of Essex's largest academic departments. Our life sciences academics are experts in the fields and as active researchers, they are ensuring the latest research findings and insights are embedded into their teaching. Expertise in our school covers a broad range of important life sciences areas across two research centers and four research groups. Their research tackles some of the key problems of the modern world and the school's research can help change lives from early cancer diagnosis and better treatment through to protecting marine environments and improving food security throughout the world. Their academic work is interdisciplinary and frequently involves collaboration with other institutions, both in the UK and internationally. Professor Hebern graduated with a BSc Honours in Zoology with Honours in Marine Biology at the University of Aberdeen in 1998, and then went on to take an MSc in Marine and Fisheries Sciences. Professor Hebern received her PhD in Coral Reef Geoscience from Manchester Metropolitan University in 2006, and then came to Essex. Leanne has worked in higher education as an educator and researcher since 2006, and during this time, she has conducted marine research across the globe, including Mexico, Indonesia, Bahrain, and Greece. Together with collaborators, they have protected oyster reefs in Essex, coral reefs in Mexico and Indonesia, and are currently close to the protection of coralliginous reefs in the Aegean Sea in the Mediterranean. <laughs> Professor Hepburn has developed new undergraduate degrees in ecology and environmental biology and global sustainability the latter of which is interdisciplinary in nature, working together with all three faculties and departments including economics, government, psychology, philosophy, and sociology. Leanne has developed 10 new modules in life sciences and has been appointed to leadership roles including director of education, director of employability, director of marine biology, sustainability lead, and currently the director of the new interdisciplinary BSc Global Sustainability Program. Liane is a strong advocate of public engagement and outreach with regular invite, invited talks, uh, public invited talks and events on TV, radio, charities, and conferences. She regularly talks in schools and colleges to inspire the next generation of environmental scientists. Professor Heburn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. I've just got to flick through Gavin's last slide. There you go. You can stay behind after. I'm sure Gavin will take you through. <laughs> wow, Gavin, you, you were ambitious. Okay. Thank you. So... Thank you so much for coming, everyone. And I really want to say a special thank you to Holly for organizing this. Um, I did have a joke that she'd be great at marketing our degrees. There's flyers everywhere. Um, that would be fantastic. Um, but I especially want to um, thank people who have come and traveled. Uh, it really is um, an honor to be presenting tonight. It's quite unusual to be presenting in front of family and friends. Um, and it takes a professorial inaugural lecture to actually get my family in the room to listen to me talking about my work. So that's, that's always good. So yeah, thank you so much. Now, I was thinking about this, as Gavin said, how do you talk for 20 minutes um, about your work? And I'm a marine scientist, but I'm also a passionate educationalist. 
and I was thinking about this talk and I was going to be in front of my friends, um, had an opportunity to buy some new shoes, um, that's an, an opportunity to celebrate, which my friends know I love so much. Um, but I was thinking about it, I was thinking, this is a really diverse group of people, and actually my educational research, some of that is on increasing diversity in environmental science. My marine research, the success there has come from working with diverse groups of people and collaborating. So I thought, okay, tonight's talk, I've only got 20 minutes, I'm going to zoom out and I'm going to talk to you about the conceptual aspects of my work around diversity and collaboration, because I feel really strongly that if we embrace those values, it can lead to a better future for all of us. So the big little questions, these are big questions, and I've got a really little amount of time to tell you about them, but I'm gonna take you through three questions, two on education and, and one on segue into marine research. So, how can we increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in environmental science? How can we collaborate across disciplines to have empowered change-making graduates? And then how can these values of diversity and collaboration accelerate the protection of marine habitats? That's really what, what I'm interested in. And I think this photo really sums it up. It's a diverse group of people all collaborating to protect the marine environment. And this was a huge beach clean that we did in Indonesia this year with Essex students uh, and students from the local university in Indonesia. Okay, so let's tackle the first question. How can we increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in environmental science? I'm gonna focus on one aspect of diversity, and that's ethnicity. Now, the School of Life Sciences is very broad. There's lots of us in the room here. We do everything from tropical marine biology to biomedical science. Um, and you can see, uh, if I can show you here, and in place, this, this here on the, on the left-hand panel, this is the years along the bottom, and this is the percentage of students. White students are in gray, and ethnic minorities here in, in, um, in pink. And what you can see quite clearly is if you were to broadly split the School of Life Sciences into environment and health, the environment side of the school, our students, is an over-representation of white students. This panel here, this is biomedical science over the years, and you can see here this bit in grey, white students, it's much more diverse. And we've known this for years, and we've thought about it, and we've got perceptions around why this might be, but we couldn't really find any empirical evidence in the, in the literature to explain why. So we set about trying to figure it out, so luckily we got some funding from NERC, the Natural Environment Research Council for the UK government. Um, but we couldn't do this on our own. We had to collaborate. So we reached out to an amazing charity called Into Science UK. And it's their mission to promote social mobility and diversity in, in science. Um, and they do that through a program of workshops and events, all sorts of, of stuff. So we reached out to collaborate with them and through doing that, we had access to over a thousand students who are applying to their programs every year. And the eligibility criteria for Into Science are things like free school meals or um, no one in your family's ever gone to university before. So, so we, we instantly had access to this large pool of applicants who were from disadvantaged or, or underrepresented backgrounds. So we, we set out some surveys within their application process. We also did a one week intensive summer school. And you can see some of the photos from that here. Tom, always make it on to presentations. Um, this is uh, photos from the lab, from the fields. They were, they were out in the, in the cone doing water quality surveys. 
Uh, they were in the lab doing genetics uh, on corals. Uh, they were with Tom out here measuring fish from our campus lakes. Um, and this is, this is one of the groups that we had. So that ran last year and, and this year as well. So let's think about the results here of, of the surveys. Um, what you can see on the left, this is just really a snapshot of the type of questions we were asking them. What are the differences for how important uh, family views are for students when they're selecting a degree? And what you can see along the, the bottom here is the self-identifying ethnicities of the applicants and then the percentage of respondents. And what you can see, hopefully, in these pretty colours, is um, that the students identifying as Arab, Asian and black, in the grey and the yellow, that's extremely important or very important. So those ethnic groups, their families' views when they're choosing what degree to study, it's really, really important. But actually, for white students, it wasn't really that important what their families thought at all. <laughs> Um, and then we asked them more specifically, because we were interested in the environment, we asked them more specifically, what, do you, what would your family think if you chose to study environmental science? And what we found was, along the x-axis here, that students identifying as Arab, Asian or black, there was between sort of 10 and 20% of those students who um, who felt like their parents or their families would, would disapprove of them studying environmental science. Um, and so we tried to find out why that was. And the reasons they gave us were the perception of low value work, uh, low paid opportunities, and the need to do lots of volunteering. And not everybody has the privilege of being able to do lots of volunteering. Um, and they're right about all three of those things. But the other thing that we found out was that actually the, these applicants, they didn't really understand the depth and breadth of, of careers in environmental science or what you could study at university related to the environment. And interestingly, it wasn't just the applicants <coughs> that didn't understand um, or didn't really fully realize the depth and breadth of what you could do studying the environment. It was also when we surveyed teachers and it was also when we surveyed parents. So what we were finding was that, that really environmental science has, um, you know, over the years there's more technology, there's lots of more different types of jobs available and, and, and really um, people don't really know about them. So that was all quite interesting. And what we decided to do was um, make a set of recommendations to other higher education institutes. And these interventions really are at the pre-degree stage. So young people, um, usually at this sort of age, between 15 to 17 years old. So we recommended uh, um, a set of workshops, so different types of workshops for young people, but importantly also for their parents or carers. So making these workshops accessible, at accessible times of day, putting on food, putting, you know, making sure that people are going to be able to come um, and offering lots of different things. British Science Week. Does anyone know when British Science Week is? Hands up if you know. Not even the scientists know. So that's not a good start. Um, we, need to, we need to make more of this. We need to be proud of this. And we need to bring people onto our campus on British Science Week. Young people from diverse backgrounds, underrepresented backgrounds. We shouldn't even be talking about diversity. It shouldn't even be a thing. It should just be diverse, normalized. Mentoring services. Now, when I say mentoring services, you're going to think, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to get scientists and they're going to mentor these young people, right? What about, what about those young people mentoring us to understand the barriers that they've experienced their whole life? Reverse mentoring. Summer schools. The summer schools we've run for the last two years Hopefully, we can continue to do those short placements, academics. Any of you academics in the audience, you could reach out to InterScience. You could bring a young person into your lab 
you could use that, use your um, experience to offer them um, opportunities. And InterScience will facilitate that. Meet the scientists. One of the best parts, the students told us one of the best parts of that week was when they got to meet scientists that looked like them from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds, that were studying the environment, that were traveling all over the world, that were having this life of curiosity. And that's what they want to see, but they don't see anybody that looks like them. So bringing in our scientists, our postgrad community, and, and showing them what they do, they, they were really excited by that. How about information packs for first generation students and their families? I'm a first generation student. No one in my family had ever been to university. It's a mysterious world <laughs> to these families. They do not know what goes on and it costs a lot of money. Why would you want to do that? Just go and get a job. Yeah? Start earning some money. No, provide them with information. Open up the window to this mysterious world and show them at least give some information about what it's like and the, how it's valued and how it's worth it. Now, the, the most pleasing thing that I've just hot off the press found out is that 100% of those students who came to the summer school last year in July are now at university studying science. Every single one. And 88% of them are studying the environment. Why they're not here, that's another question. <laughs> okay, Holly's on the job. Okay, so we're really excited about that. But I think it's important to say that, like I say, I shouldn't even be talking about this, but we've still got loads of work to do. We really have. So um, hopefully this project, is, it, it's moving things in the right direction, but we've, we've still got a long way to go. Okay, second question. How can we collaborate across disciplines to create change-making graduates? Well, I'm sure we'll see at Essex University all our graduates are change-making. Of course they are. Um, but this degree, as Maria introduced, is um, the first degree that spans across three faculties, arts, science, humanities. Now, I've heard people say, why on earth do you want to do that? What are they going to do their PhD in? You have to be specific. No, I really don't believe you do. We need interdisciplinary education, higher education. The research agenda is now moving, well, it has been for years, moving towards interdisciplinary um, ways. And, and education needs to follow that. So this degree is a science degree. It's based in life sciences, but they can take optional modules from all these different um, departments across the whole university. Why, why bother? Well, society is facing really complex problems. We've got the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the economy, inequality, all of these things. But I think where we're going wrong is we're looking at these issues in isolation. They're not issues in isolation. You can't have the climate crisis without the biodiversity crisis. And you can't have um, the climate crisis without inequality. And it's also going to affect the economy. So we need graduates of the future to be able to understand the language across these different disciplines and understand how you do the analysis. Um, but we've got a window of opportunity here. We've got a window of opportunity to keep global temperatures below two degrees above pre-industrial. We've already baked in 1.3 degrees. You know, we have to move fast. And I truly believe that creating these graduates, educating students to understand different disciplines will really help us be able to solve these complex problems in the future. And for this degree, we're not just teaching across, uh, across different departments. We're turning higher education on its head and we're using problem-based learning. We're bringing in industry. We're having open conversations. We're tasking the students to come up with these innovative solutions to the problems. And I'll tell you something, they've come up with much better <laughs> ideas than I have. They're brilliant. And I really believe in this. And the students are fantastic. And I'm going to have to tell you some quotes of what they've said. So it's not just me telling you that it's great. So the obvious one, I suppose, my experience being wonderful. I'm tailoring the degree to my interests. I can't read that from there. 
Having gained experience in politics, economics, ethics, philosophy, sociology, and international relations, I've broadened my wider knowledge and gained a better understanding of the applicability of science in real world settings. You can get a basis of scientific knowledge and then expand your understanding of the subject by looking at it from political, psychological, sociological perspectives. And finally, science can sometimes be very self-contained and distant from other fields of study, which is why this sort of interdisciplinary degree is really special, because I feel like I will be prepared to bridge that gap. I really believe in this degree, and the students do too. We just need more of them, um, and that's, that's, um, that's Holly's job. She's getting that job. <coughs> okay. So what's all this got to do with marine conservation, I hear you say? Um, well, I work mainly on benthic, so stuff that lives in the bottom and produces carbonate. So tropical coral reefs, this um, photograph is from Bahrain and the Persian Gulf, where we've got an ongoing project. Um, oyster reefs locally around Essex and, and more recently coralogenous reefs in the, in the Aegean Sea. Now, throughout my, my time, I've spent a number of hours, lots and lots of hours actually underwater documenting these habitats and species and trying to understand them. But we don't really have that much time now to be able to do that. And fortunately, we've got amazing technology. We've got drones, we've got remote sensing, we've got, we've got all this stuff. Um, but we really need, we really don't have the, the luxury of time anymore with these habitats. So we are at a critical point in time, and I truly believe the decisions we make now and in the next decade are gonna steer the course of our future on this planet. That's the truth. So the goal is to protect 30% of the ocean by 2030. And that's come out of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, and it's a global ocean alliance of 77 countries, and they've all come together and said, that's what we're going to do. But to be able to do that, we really have to act now, and, and we need a radical shift in perspective of how we do this. Um, and we need to collaborate. Back to my values, this common goal of collaborating across oceans with NGOs, charities, our communities, artists. If you want to hear about an amazing collaboration we did in, in a, an art exhibition with our artists in the audience in the summer, um, and, and the engagement data we collected from that, you know, it's, it's engaging the local community. And I really do feel this is life sciences and estuaries. You know, we, we, we need to get out and, and make sure that the message um, is, is getting out there for us to be able to do this, otherwise it's, it's just not gonna work. So I wanted to give you an example of where this is working for us, hopefully, at the moment. And this is coralogenous reefs in the Aegean Sea, in the Mediterranean. And this work is with Archipelagos, who are our partners in Greece. They're an amazing NGO, um, really well-established uh, NGO working in Greece. Now, coralogenous reefs, um, it's an odd one. I think people maybe just think of tropical reefs. Coralogenous reefs are not built by corals. They're built by coralline algae. And it's this red stuff here. It's a red, hard, encrusting algae, and it builds reef, and then loads of other stuff come and live on it. So it provides all this structural complexity for thousands of other species. It's, it's a really critical habitat for feeding and for breeding. We've found shark egg cases, we've found squid egg cases, loads of amazing stuff. And this is sort of a, a small image of what it looks like. So these habitats are protected by uh, the EU, but the issue is that we don't know where they are. So in the Mediterranean, in the Western Med, these habitats are mapped quite well. But in the Eastern Med in Greece, we don't really know where they are. And we've been talking about it for years. We've been talking about it for a long time with, with Archipelagos. You know, we know they're out there. How are we going to find them? Uh, where do we think they are? How are we going to get the money? Where, how far do we have to travel? All those kind of things. 
And I should say as well, these are mesophotic reefs, so they're about, these photos are from about 80, 100 metres. This is Thanassus, and Thanassus is quite obviously a fisherman, a small scale fisherman. Um, I love this photo. Um, and he is really the last generation of knowledge of, of where all these habitats are, in his head at least. And um, fishermen don't always tell you what you want to know. You have to spend a lot of time with them. You know, you have to take out their grandparents and the aunties and the br brothers and cousins and have dinner and everything else. But eventually, when you build strong, trusted relationships and understand that everyone's trying to work together, you can get somewhere. And Thanasis finally, and you can see on his little paper map there, set out with stones, finally gave us the locations of where we'd be able to find these coralogenous reefs. Thank you, Thanasis. This is another fisherman with the Archipelagos team. And he had slightly more sophisticated technology. He's got a fish finder and he could actually show us and give us very specific GPS locations of where we were gonna find them. Yes, 10 years it took. Um, and off we went. And this is the Aegean Explorer. This is a research vessel of Archipelagos. Um, and this is Tim. This is the um, images from the multi-beam sonar. We have ROVs and multi-beams. And we were able to go out and, um, and find them. And this is a sh very short clip. So you can see it in motion of what we found. So all of the pink stuff there, that's coralline algae, hard encrusting coralline algae. The yellow and the orange are sponges, but we were also finding these ghost fishing nets at this depth. So everywhere we looked, we were finding fishing nets. Um, but really, really spectacular habitats. So we've got an area that we're trying to make a fisheries restricted area. Um, so small scale boats will still be able to fish there, but excluded from large industrial trawlers. And there's lots of other people involved, but Archipelagos as an NGO is the main partner. This work wouldn't be possible without them. Obviously the university and the Greek government are on board. They're super excited about these habitats. They couldn't believe it when, when um, the scientific direct director at Archipelagos took the videos to show them. Like, wow, really? What, they're just off the coast at 80 meters deep? Nobody knows where they are. The issue is well, you could go out there tomorrow and they'd be trolled. And if they're trolled, they're not coming back. So we need to know where they are to be able to map them, to be able to protect them. So um, I'll never get my family and friends in the room again, but I will let you know <laughs> if this um, happens, hopefully next year. Another example of um, where diversity and collaboration has worked and been really successful is uh, the native oyster beds around the coast of Essex. So this was originally did you know you're sitting on a, a marine conservation zone right now? Not actually on it, but it's just there. Um, I asked my marine biology students today if they knew that, and um, they're, they've just arrived, fresh new first years, and they didn't know either. So again, it's about getting this message out. You're actually sitting just five minute walk from here on the largest inshore marine conservation zone in the UK. And it's protected for the native oyster. Why is it protected for the native oyster? Because Essex Wildlife Trust began the process of lobbying government to get it listed as, a, as an MCZ. And then scientists from the University of Essex helped design the study to collect the data. ZSL got involved with funding. They created this amazing um, uh, initiative, Essex Native Oyster Restoration Initiative. And, and lo and behold, the, the oystermen obviously with all these diverse groups of people working together, we now pretty much understand the population abundance distribution of where the oysters are. And thanks to work with, with Tom and, and our, one of our PhD students, we pretty much hopefully know how long into the future that, that you actually might be able to start harvesting those native oysters again. But it was only possible through collaborating with lots of different people um, so that's just a little snapshot of another example. There's, I also have them on coral reefs, but I haven't got time to tell you about that. So in summary, 
Um, what have we been doing? Well, we've increased diversity in environmental science degrees from 13% in 2020 to 26% this year. So, you know, it's moving in the right direction. We're empowering young people to study the environment through these summer schools and placements. We're educating future thinkers with the new interdisciplinary degree. Of course, all our degrees do that. <laughs> um, protecting and restoring oyster beds in the Blackwater estuary and mapping and working to protect coralogenous reefs in the Aegean by working with diverse groups of people collaborating. It really is the way. And this quote is attributed to Einstein. I don't know for sure if he said it, but I like it. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. How did we get here? The climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the economy, inequality. How did we get here? We got here through linear thinking, selfishness, a colonial mindset, take, make, waste, GDP as a measure of success, all of those things. So how are we going to move forward? We have to diversify, we have to collaborate, and we have to adapt. But what if we aspire to a future that's better than it is now? What if we move forward with a positive mind shift? A name for that. Will that influence our daily habits and behaviours? I am optimistic about the future, but I'm urgently optimistic. I'm conditionally optimistic. We've got the tools. We know what we need to do. And we have to be optimistic because only with urgency and optimism will you have action. If you have urgency and pessimism, you'll have despondency, you'll have overwhelm, and you won't have any action. And we need action. So there's lots of people to thank. Some of them are online, I hope. Um, and some of them are in the room. They all know who they are. It takes a village, I think. It's true. Um, so I just want to thank my sister. Hopefully she's happy with that photo. That's a surprise for her. Um, for always steering the course. Um, my family, they'll probably be mortified, <laughs> head and hands. But don't worry, because we now know you got your fitness from me. Thank you for that, Gavin. Um, Ross, Oscar, my husband, uh, Oscar and Isla for, for always being there. They do support me. They think I'm always on holiday. It's not true. I'm working. Um, and my parents um, for instilling a strong work ethic. Thank you, mum. Down to you. Um, always tell me how many jobs she had. It was at least three at any one time. And my dad, who always told me about the value of opportunity in education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leanne, for this very thought-provoking presentation and uh, sending out really key messages. We as academics, we need to go out, but we also need to bring the public in so that they can realize the value of education and the amazing work that we are doing across the university and in particular in the Faculty of Science and Health that I'm very proud to be the executive dean of. Our final professor this evening is Professor Jonathan Worrell from the School of Life Sciences. Jonathan obtained both his undergraduate and PhD degrees from the chemistry department at the University of Newcastle. In 1999, he took up postdoctoral studies in the metalloprotein and engineering group at the Leiden Institute of Chemistry in the Netherlands. Here, he applied, or there, he applied paramagnetic NMRI, NMR spectroscopy to investigate the complexes formed between heme enzymes and their protein electron donors. In 2005, he returned to the UK, taking a postdoctoral position at the University of Cambridge, where he engaged with applying X-ray crystallographic approaches in studies of macromolecular assemblies. In 2007, he accepted a lectureship at the University of Essex, where he has contributed extensively 
to teaching on the biochemistry degree course and continues to pursue research into the oxidative chemistries carried out by him and Copper and <laughs> Professor Worrell, over to you. Take the. Did you take it with us? Uh, oh, okay. Oh. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I'd also like to echo um, Leanne's thanks as well to Holly. I mean, it was um, several emails to get me going on this, and I eventually got my talk across. So um, it's, it's very uh, nice to get my eyes liaising with Holly, um, and also like to you know congratulate Leanne and Gavin for excellent talks, and um, well, I know I'm the final act, so I know that you want to go and get a drink and a canapé, if there's any left, and I know this is a tough sell, and it's particularly a tough sell because I don't have the sort of s research that I think, you know, is, is quite easy to get across, so, so just bear with me, I'll try to make it as simple as possible. Um, and this isn't the, my title of the talk, is it? No. So yes, yeah, so I. Oh, sorry. So I simply titled my talk "A Living with Oxygen." Okay. So you know, Maria reads this spiel about our department that we do all these wonderful things, and she's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yeah. But you know, sometimes we forget about oxygen. We just take it for granted, <laughs> right? So I'm hopefully going to convince you, at least in the first part of my talk, that we can't live without it obviously, but it's also a challenge to live with it, okay? And then I'll go on to tell you a little bit about the research that I do using the enzymes, so enzymes, proteins, so I'm on the molecular and at the atom atomistic scale here, whereas Gavin <laughs> is, you know, a human or a child, and Leanne is a coral and, and, and a fish or whatever, so I'm slightly different, so I, you know, just try to stay with me. I'll try to go as quickly as possible, but I'll also try to... Um, you know, t uh, to try to hopefully uh, make you realise that, um, you know, ha the importance of, of oxygen. Okay, so I would argue uh, to anyone, actually, that the top two chemical reactions on Earth are photosynthesis and respiration. Okay, so I think we can all accept that. Okay, so photosynthesis, I hope that many of you will know. This is a plant, a plant leaf, there's one here. There's components in the plant leaf, special components that can extract the light from the sun, and it can take CO2, water, and it can produce glucose, so an energy source, but importantly, it produces oxygen, and in particular, molecular oxygen. Okay, so not elemental oxygen, but molecular oxygen. Respiration, okay, this drives all aerobic life on Earth. Okay, so it take we take, we, a human, or any other aerobic organism, whether it be a microbe, uh, or a, uh, an archaea, it takes the molecular oxygen and it takes a fuel, so glucose, and we release CO2 and we release water, but importantly, we generate energy. So this is a firmid, what we call a thermodynamically favourable reaction. So, you know, loosely, loosely, this is combustion. So you all know what combustion is, okay? You have an oxidizer, you have a fuel, and you ignite it and you produce energy. Okay, so respiration is essentially loosely described as combustion. So if we think about it, the Earth's atmosphere is composed of 21% of oxygen. So we're living, as I stand here now, we're living in an oxidizer, in an oxidizing environment. So you can actually think, you know, well, why aren't I combusting? Why aren't we combusting? You know, it sounds silly, but, you know, if you think about it, why aren't we? Charles Dickens actually wrote about combustion in the, in the 1800s in some of his novels. Actually, some of the characters that he peeled off in his novels, he talks about spontaneous combustion. Alcoholics sitting near the fire. There's ethanol in your body, oxygen, heat, combustion. But this is not the case. We know that. <laughs> we know that this is not true. So how are we able to live with oxygen and not combust? So I'm sorry we have to... Uh, talk a little bit about chemistry. So, I mean, I'm hoping that we all recognize the periodic table. We have some idea what this is. So oxygen, I don't know if this pointer is working, I can't see. But oxygen is, is, in, is in group 16. 
It's got an atomic number of eight, so it contains uh, eight protons in the nucleus. And around the nucleus of any atom, you have electrons. So there's eight electrons spinning around. So chemists, originally like myself, like to look at molecules. So of course oxygen, molecular oxygen that photosynthesis produces a molecule. They like to try to explain the reactivity of the molecule by looking at diagrams. Okay, and particularly, electrons tell you, or give you an insight, or the way the electrons are arranged in a molecule, give you an insight to how reactive that molecule is. I'm not going to go into detail here. You just have to understand that we use molecular orbital theory. Okay, so if you have two elements, they come together, they stay together because you have interactions between the orbitals. And within the orbitals, there's electrons. The take-home message here is, is that as we fill up, so eight electrons from one oxygen, eight electrons from the other, as we fill these up into these molecular orbitals, we're left with what we call two unpaired electrons. And this is a biradical. So if I mention the word radical to you, oh, you think, oh, it must be a bit rogue. You know, it's a bit naughty. <laughs> okay? And you would be right, yeah? A radical, as you know, as you hear, is a reactive species. But this is a biradical. Okay, and strangely, this is one of the few elements where this diradical is actually stable. And the reason it's stable is because you've got these two parallel spins of these electrons. Okay? The second reason it's so stable is, and I'm not going to try to explain this in any other way, is it, but you just have to understand this is what we call a triplet state. This is the ground state of oxygen. Okay? If you, an oxygen, of course, is an oxidizer. It accepts electrons. Okay, so it accepts an electron to reduce it. We're reducers, so it accepts electrons from this. To get that first electron in here is what we call spin forbidden. It doesn't like it. You can't have a chemical reaction that changes the spin state of the electron. Okay, so it's kinetically inert. So therefore, it reacts very, 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 very slowly with all the organic matter around us. We can change that if we heat it. If we heat it, we take it to another state, and you know from the fire triangle, fuel, oxygen, heat, ignition, you create a fire. So we quite happily sit here tonight, bathed in oxygen, and we're bathed in oxygen, and we can survive. We don't combust because of the chemical nature of the ground state oxygen. Great. But not great for biology, for aerobic biology, because as I stand here tonight, we've got thousands of reactions going on in our bodies which require what we call aerobic um, oxidative catalysis, aerobic uh, biology. Okay? So you need oxygen to work very quickly. So we have to activate it. Okay? So how do we do that? Well, again, nature came to our rescue, and it uses um, to, able to, to be able to exploit the use of oxygen in a timely manner, shall I say. Oxygen is activated by using metalloenzymes. Okay, so these proteins or enzymes, they contain a metal. Okay, so again, you still have some concept of what a metal is. When you ask you what a metal is, you may think, oh, it contains electrons. And the metals contain lots of unpaired electrons. And these can readily react with the ground state of oxygen. The main protagonists in our bodies and in, in aerobic biology are iron and copper. And these can donate electrons to oxygen and they can activate it. So it's not per se oxygen which is oxidizing and carrying out these oxidating reactions. It's now these metal oxygen compounds that are in our body and in other uh, microbes or organisms on Earth, which are now carrying out, these, uh, car or carrying out oxidative reactions which we require to survive uh, on Earth. So some of you may recognize this. So this is a heme, a heme group. So you'll have heard of heme from hemoglobin, myoglobin, that carries oxygen. Okay. These are just non-heme ions. This is called a non-heme ion, so this is just a single ion, and you also have copper. So, these, what, so the point of this slide is just to illustrate to you that it is these metal oxygen intermediates which carry out the oxidative chemistry that allows us to exist on Earth. <laughs> so now... Aerobic biology is in control of oxygen. So we can, by activating oxygen, by creating these metal oxygen species, we can control how we can use oxidative reactions. There is a dark side to oxygen, okay, which um, we should at least be aware of. And this is when something goes wrong in the cell. So under cellular stress, 
you can create now radicals. So these are singlet radicals, so these are dangerous molecules. Superoxide, particularly the hydroxyl radical, maybe less so the peroxide molecule. Oh, sorry. Ah. But again, nature's got a way to uh, sort of combat these uh, potentially toxic species. And again, it's metalloenzymes, so enzymes that contain metal centers are available to mop up and provide also a protective role, role to the cell. Okay, so these are crystal structures of enzymes which we have solved here in Essex. Okay, and all these enzymes represent families in which oxidative chemistry occurs. So these are copper enzymes that we've worked on. So this is copper oxidase, this is an LPMO. And on this side of the slide, these are heme enzymes. So these enzymes contain a heme group. Okay, so I've mentioned that before. I'm not going to go into the details of what they do, but you can see they're not medically relevant, okay? But they do have biotechnology relevance, in particular for biofuel production, textile industry, and again for biofu biofuel production. So uh, I just want to try again to get the message across. You know, these enzymes are incredibly important in terms of life as we know it, okay? And also, you have to appreciate the catalytic capability of oxygen and peroxide activating heme enzymes for oxidizing reactions is truly enormous. Uh, in fact, you know, we know what these do in nature, but we're now at a stage where we can take what we think we know and we can develop it further to create product profiles, so new products being formed that, you know, we could never imagine previously. And again, I should just point out to you, Francis Arnold in 28, 2018, she won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for Directed Involution. And most of the work that she did to win this Nobel Prize was actually on heme enzymes. Okay, because she realized by carrying out directed evolution of heme enzymes, she could, even though we don't truly understand how the oxidative catalysis occurs, you could create new chemistries. And this is important as we move forward for a sustainable future. I don't want to dwell too much on this here, but you know, the importance of these enzymes can be seen here. So for the cytochrome P450 family, if you look at these organic molecules, I'm just going to tell you, they're inert. You can't really do anything with them. But if you can oxidize them and you can put on a functional group, such as a hydroxide, you now have a handle which you can do downstream synthesis and drug targets, and it makes them much more active. Many of you would have taken codeine, I think. And again, Heme enzymes, cytochrome P450s, they activate by demethylating to create these more active components of codeine. And finally, it's topical, it was in the news today, so the flight that took off from London to New York was flown using um, fats, which were then converted into you know, new sort of fuels that we can use in, uh, in, 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 in aeroplanes. Oh, sorry, I keep pushing the wrong one, sorry. Okay, so my aim, so uh, yes, I should quickly get to what I want to tell you from my research. So, so uh, my aim basically has been to address a long-standing fundamental question. So my research is fundamental, I don't apologize for that, that's what it is, it's fundamental. And we're still, even though we know they are super powerful and they can do lots and lots of good things, we still don't know what controls the catalytic reactivity of oxidative heme enzymes. Okay, research questions. There's a lot of text inside, I don't want to go through them, okay? I think you get my drift here. Okay, so we don't know what controls the reactivity and stability of these high energy oxidative intermediates, these metal oxygen species. How do the movements of protons and electrons within the protein scaffold influence the oxi oxygen activation event? We don't really know that. And what's important is that we don't know the factors that direct substrate binding and influence the chemo, regio, and or stereospecificity of substrate oxidation. So this is to get new products, new materials. We don't really know that. The approaches that we use are X-ray crystallography, spectroscopy. So to do this, we, use, we require microcrystals. So we're taking our protein solutions that we obtain from the laboratory and we try to crystallize them into a solid state. And if we can do all this, is what I'm going to tell you in the next five minutes, then I predict that we will provide new, unprecedented atom atomistic insights into aerobic biologi biological processes and provide new approaches for application of oxidative biocatalysts for a sustainable future. X-rays, okay. So these are not hospital X-rays. These are actually much more powerful X-rays. 
So there's two types of light sources that we use. Okay, the synchrotron okay, that I've depicted here. So the electrons are injected into this storage ring, and then they're injected into this booster ring. They whiz round, and then at a certain point in this booster, run, booster ring, these, these X-rays are emitted. Scientists are sitting in these stations, and they take the X-rays, and they can be used. The other source is the X-ray free electron laser. And this is I've depicted here, as you can see. So again, you have to have an electron source. The electron's ejected, and now it wiggles, and you create much more intense X-rays. Okay, so this is a much stronger uh, X-ray source. So in terms of the XFEL, there's only five of these in the world. Okay, so Essex has been very lucky, but we've been very successful in applying for time. So we're competing in peer review processes, so it's very difficult to get this time, along with my collaborators. So the th so and we've actually we've been very lucky in the last four or five years. We've actually visited four of the five. So the one that we use the most is in Japan. So you can see this is the Expel facility. This is the synchrotron. Okay, so this is the Expel facility. We visited South Korea. You can see the PAL Expel here. This is in Stanford in the USA. You can see the the Expel here. So this is San Francisco in the background. Uh, and we've also visited the Swiss Fell in uh, Switzerland. And you can see that the Swiss are very conservation <laughs> um, um, considerate, and they built their Expel actually in a forest, and it's actually very nice uh, to visit. So what's serial crystallography? So I don't really have a lot of time to go into this. What, you have to what serial crystallography is, is that we use thousands and thousands of microcrystals. Think of them as grains of sand. You pick up grains of sand off the beach, and I pour them through my hand. We somehow get them into the X-ray beam, and we hit them once. And as we hit them, we record a diffraction pattern. From that diffraction pattern, we can, uh, we can uh, uh, obtain the atomic structure of that molecule. Okay? Two times here, 10 fem femtoseconds, or microseconds, sorry, milliseconds. Okay? So this allows us to access the kinetics of a reaction. Okay, so these metal oxygen species can be either long-lived or short-lived. And if we have a variability in the time that we use to um, expose them to x-rays, that would allow us to look at reactions in real time. This is what we mean by time-resolved crystallography. So when you're a professor, you have to have a vision. At least that's what I was told. So, uh, and you know, and as a professor, you also have massive imposter syndrome on steroids. So... You know, so this is my vision, and this is not just my vision, it's my vision with collaborators, okay? So I'm, we've got some very good collaborators. So we want to create a serial time-resolved crystallography pipeline for creating molecular movies of heme enzymes in action. So when you look at pictures of proteins in a textbook, they're static. That's not true. They move. Everything moves in biology, okay? That's what you remember from school. Chemistry, smells, physics doesn't work, and biology moves, <laughs> right? So it moves, um, and you know, for years we've not looked at this, okay? So we want to try to instigate a time-resolved component in looking at enzymes in action. I just happen to choose heme enzymes, but you could have rolled this out to many, many other enzyme systems that you may be interested in. Okay, so very briefly, because I know that I'm running out of time. So somehow we have to get these microcrystals, think of the grains of sand falling into the X-rays, we somehow have to get these microcrystals into the beam. Okay, so we have to build bespoke systems to do that. We then want to start a reaction. We want to initiate the reaction. So we either want to give it the oxidants, so it can be hydrogen peroxide, or you may be thinking, well, how do you give oxygen? It's a gas. Okay, well, there's ways that we can do that. We can either put this system in an oxygen chamber, or we can initiate the release of oxygen from something called a photocage. So we initiate the reaction, and then we want to measure diffraction, so as quickly as we can, to see what's happening in the crystal. But at the same time, it would be fantastic if we could use another approach, which would be spectroscopy, because we have metal centers. Spectroscopy are very amenable to metal, cent uh, to, to, to metal centers. We can get a lot of information from that, and it would you know, enrich the, the, the diffraction data that we're collecting. And then eventually, and we're not we're near this yet at the moment, we would like to integrate all this data into multi-scale computational modeling to give us a really full and thorough function and mechanistic view of how oxygen reacts with these particular heme enzymes. Right, very quickly, 
I'll give you this example. So this is the chip method, okay? So this is your chip. You load your microcrystals onto the chip, and then you mount it on this stage, and you can see the X-ray beam doesn't move, but the chip moves, okay? And as you can see from here and from here, you scan the chip, and if there's a crystal in the, uh, the apertures, you'll get diffraction. So this is the example that I give you. So this is serial femtose femtosecond crystallography, so expel of the resting state. So this has got no oxidizing species added now. And then activated. Okay, so this is one of these peroxidase that I introduced you to earlier. And we recorded this in Sakura in Japan. So this is the ferric state. So you can see the blue is the experimental data. That's the electron density that you generate from collecting diffraction patterns. And in this electron density, you can see that you can build amino acids. And in this case, you can build the heme. So you can see very nicely. When we, add, when we mix with peroxide, so the oxidant, there's no substrate there. And because there's no substrate there, that means that the oxygen can hang around a little bit longer than normal. If the substrate's there, then it reacts very quickly. We were lucky because we found in this particular case that the, this iron oxygen species hung around for a long time. So here you can see, and I should say this is at room temperature, normally crystallography is done under frozen solutions. This is room temperature, and this is now an iron oxo, iron 4 oxo, compound, what we call a compound one species, and this is a potent oxidizing species that nature uses to carry out oxidative reactions. Okay, and this is the first crystal structure to demonstrate that at room temperature. Okay, finally, the second system which I show you, and this was done at LTLS in Stanford in the USA, and we did this very recently. I did this during my sabbatical. So thank you for granting me a sabbatical now. <laughs> okay, so this is now time resolved. Okay, so now we want to look at time resolved. Okay, and we want to couple this with spectroscopy, and we use X-ray emission spectroscopy. Don't have time to go into that. You just have to accept that this is an additional a tool that we can use. We're now going to use the tape drive. Okay, so you can see here. Hopefully, you can see that the tape drive. So the, this is a video of the tape drive. It's slowed down massively. These are y these are your protein. This is your protein micro. This is the microcrystal drops of the microcrystals of your protein. Okay, this is the time. So you inject with an oxidant, again we use peroxide, and then you can set how quickly you want this tape drive to run around here before it hits the actual beam, okay? So we use these uh, acoustic drop ejectors, okay? They're very clever, very well designed, and they release a set amount of peroxide, you can see that being released into the microcrystals, okay? So we know what the concentration of the oxidant is in the microcrystals, and from this we can get that information. This is on DTP-AA, so again, it's another one of the peroxidases that I introduced you to very quickly, but just note that it's got two hemes, okay? So this is preliminary data, and we collected this in September, and we're still working through it, but what you have here, excitingly, I think, is the start of a molecular movie, of looking at the reaction initiation of a heme enzyme when it's reacting with peroxide. So I, you know, I don't have time to go into all this, but you can see this is time zero. This is before we injected the peroxide. 500 milliseconds a second, five seconds. We have two hemes, so you've got to run two movies. We then left it for a little bit, and then we recorded an end state. Okay, so we're analyzing this data at the moment. So what you're doing here is you're watching the formation of this potent oxidizing heme species, which is used in biology. Excitingly for us, maybe not for you, but <laughs> excitingly for us, we see spectroscopic changes as well. So this is great. Okay, this is great because this helps us feed into the electronic state, the redox state, et cetera, et cetera, when we want to do the computational modeling, which who knows whenever that will take place. Okay, I finish. Okay, so it's been a journey uh, to get to this imposter syndrome on steroids. Um, and, you know, I've put pictures on people up here who have helped me along the way. Uh, I know have really helped me along the way. I've been very supportive in terms of my, uh, my, 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 my career. I have some fantastic collaborators, I have to say. Many of them are in these group photos here uh, from our times when we visit the Expo. I mean, it is a wonderful experience. I am, I am very fortunate to be able to travel to these places. Maybe not so much when we want to look at sustainability. <laughs> of the cost of the flights and the, uh, the, the carbon dioxide we're using, but still, it's a great experience. I've had fantastic PhD students, many of them are on here, uh, and postdocs uh, who have contributed, I mean, more to what I've shown you today. This is relatively recent work. 
Um, and also my family is important as well, uh, I have to say. They've, they've helped me a lot along the way and kept me, uh, kept me sane. But, but finally, this is my final slide, I know that we want to go. I don't do reflection. I don't, I mean, I just don't want to think what's happened in the past. I just, it, you know, it's just too traumatic for me most of the time. <laughs> I, I, I kid you not, it's, it's true, right? But, you know, I knew this talk was coming, and it does make you sort of, like, think, you know, for whatever we've given these three talks tonight, it does make you think a little bit of where you've come and how you've got here, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't know, we all believe in something or whatever, right? And I've started to wonder... <laughs> about faith, right? <laughs> um, um, I, I'm not, I, know, I know I don't have any jokes like Gavin. It's not supposed to be a joke, this, but I'm just, I was just wondering about it. So Maria, you know, you're right. I did my PhD. I'm an undergraduate at Newcastle. This is the Bedson building. This is the chemistry building. I loved it here. It was fantastic. In 1994, second year, sorry, oh, sorry, this guy, Andy Halton, he delivered lectures to me and they were called bioinorganic chemistry. Now, for many of you in this room, probably going, what the hell is that? It's basically metals in biology, to, to, to make it simple. Yeah, But it was chemistry, so we had to call it bioinorganic chemistry. Andy, he was an Essex graduate. And he was a new lecturer uh, at Newcastle. Andy graduated from Essex, I think, in about 85. He did his PhD in 89. So he's, one of the, you know, he's a chemi he in the chemistry department. We are in the chemistry department, the old chemistry department, it's my life sciences. Yeah. He inspired me because he talked about a moss bar spec spectroscopy that Essex had. Essex was famous for moss bar spectroscopy. You don't know what that is. It doesn't matter, but it just allows you to look at oxidation states of iron. And Andy was really inspiring, I have to say. And he's the one that really led me to do my PhD with Jeff Sykes, fellow of the Royal Society. Sadly, he's no longer with us. I did my PhD in metalloenzymes, metalloproteins, and heme enzymes, as I've shown you today. Okay? So... Where's the faith? So Essex, okay, so then I did my PhD, and I did my PhD, and I went to, went to Leiden, as Maria uh, pointed out. And when I went to Leiden, I didn't think, I thought my PhD examiner was someone else, okay, but it turned out I got a phone call from Jeff because he didn't do email, he couldn't use a computer, and he said that your PhD examiner's changed. Oh, I said, okay, who is it? He said, you like him a lot, he works on heme enzymes and copper enzymes, and he's from Essex. I thought, okay, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'll just rock up, do the Viva, and go back to Leiden. Anyway, I rocked him and did the Viva. And who was it? None other than Mike Wilson. <laughs> uh, so, is it fate? Well, I did the Viva. I went back to Leiden, stayed there, came back to Cambridge, and then there was a job advert in 2007 for Essex. And of course, like Cambridge, Colchester, not too far, blah, blah, blah. I came for the job interview, and they said to me, <laughs> Something along the lines of, yes, we're really interested to hire a metalloprotein person, someone to replace Mike. <laughs> yeah, because so, Mike was retiring, that's the point. And what I want to say is, is that it's impossible to replace Mike. Yeah. No one can replace Mike. And really, if I'm honest with you, Mike is still the, re is the reason that I'm still at Essex from t uh, since 2007. Every project that we've done in my lab, Mike contributes to intellectually and experimentally. He's a fantastic colleague. He's been here for 50 years. The university is 60. <laughs> Mike came in 1973, okay? And of all the people I want to thank, you know, on the previous slide, they're great, fantastic family friends. I thank Mike the most because I don't joke about imposter syndrome on steroids. It is, I mean, yeah, it's, I, it, I find it challenging to think where I've come and how I've come. And I think a lot of it is down to Mike. Through the Essex connection that I made over 20 years ago through Andy Halton, I did my Viva with Mike. I came to supposedly replace Mike. I haven't replaced Mike, and make Mike's been a huge source of support. And as you can see, we don't just do experiments in the lab. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And if I can invite all three of our professors to join me. I know you are all geared up for a drink, uh, but you will just have to bear with us. I think we need to give the audience the opportunity to ask at least one question to each one of our professors. But before I do so, I just want to thank you all 
for the really engaging presentations that you gave today. It really make me proud to be uh, the executive dean of the Faculty of Science and Health. And the self-reflection and honesty, uh, Jonathan. And great to hear about the so many Essex connections. So do we have questions from our audience for our professors? If you will forgive me, I've got the lights coming onto my face. So if you can raise your hand and we've got colleagues that will help you. Because if you don't ask a question, then I will. And I'm not sure you do. Ah, thank you. Leon, uh, it's yeah. my sister. <laughs> <laughs> Tried to slide under there, but didn't make it. <laughs> How do you think that we will be able to achieve the fifty year, fifty percent in fifty years? Thank you, sister. <laughs> thirty percent of the ocean protected by twenty thirty. We're pretty much in twenty twenty four, so we've got six years. Currently, um, less than 3% of the ocean is protected. Um, highly protected, probably even less than that. So, of course, I am urgently optimistic. <laughs> yes, we can do it. Um, but it is a grand challenge, and we're not moving fast enough. Um, and I think um, uh, I talked about the the local marine conservation zone that you're all sitting on right now. And that was designated under a single objective to, to protect the native oyster. And that's great and it's worked and it's fabulous, but it was a, it was a, there was a lot of bumps in the road because you're working um, to on a single objective to protect one species, but then you're working in a habitat that's actually protected under a different designation. So I think moving forward to be able to protect 30% of our ocean by 2030, we have to look at global priorities. We can probably use some of the areas that are already protected, um, but we have to start looking at multi-level objectives and not just trading off against um, biodiversity and conservation, but actually looking at the bigger picture, diversify and collaborate. <laughs> Thank you. Um, have we got questions for Jonathan or Gapin? Yes. They're either made of lower quality, sorry, they're either made of lower quality muscle or they are a bit fatter and it just doesn't show up in the way we measure it. That's the, the, the simple answer. So, you know, pound for pound, they are definitely made of different stuff. So they probably, they are a wee bit fatter than they used to be. They weigh the same, and, but, uh, but they're, you know, they're taller and they weigh more. But, um, but actually, muscle is not just, the bigger the muscle is not the better the muscle. The better the quality muscle, the better, the, the stronger it is. So they're made of worse muscle. Uh, that's all I can think of saying. <laughs> yeah, well, they're not, not, or not using it. Uh, any questions for Jonathan? Oh, we have a gentleman. I'm glad to hear that uh, interdisciplinary research is actually um, on the move because I think for many years during my lifetime it was always an aspiration it was always in research proposal but it never really n you know when you pinched everything you began to realize that it was a lot of it was just parallel lines or somehow in movement um, but a question that really prompt that some all of the lecturers really prompted um, my thoughts saying were um, how did Yes, we are now, as scientists and technologists and people in the research, are trying to get inputs from various um, humanities. How do we get the science back to those who li whose lives are in the humanities, in the politics, in the economics of the world? That, because that, um, I grew up with um, C.P. Snow's two, um, you know, the, the, the two worlds of 
did you say? And the fact is, we were told by my English teacher at school, if we ever went into science, we should always make sure we understand the parameters first. We had to speak to the people who really made the decisions. So how do we make them understand some of the work that you're doing here? And we appreciate it and get involved. I, I, I have an answer for everything according to my mother. So I think we tell them stories. And I think that's what humans, we did, we did around the campfire, we've done, it, we evolved to listen to stories. And, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, you'll notice I didn't finish my talk, too busy telling <laughs> stories. So I you think that's what you it. do. Thank you very much. Um, let me tell you a story. No, um, but, you, you know, you do. You know, I, I've talked to Lord Select Committees. I've done, um, <coughs> you know, government panels. And there, the most engaging thing is not necessarily case studies, but it's, it's a narrative. It's giving people a narrative of where this comes from. I think Jonathan did it beautifully. It's the hardest, of, you know, the first time I've understood that. I now know what a synchrotron is, for God's sake. Right, so it's... But it's, you know, telling stories, getting people involved in a narrative and, and involving people in it. And sometimes it's on an official level, sometimes it's on a casual level. And the other way to do it is, of course, through talking to the media. And, you know, if you have a face like mine going on the radio. We're conscious of time. Do we have a question for Jonathan or... I think I've got a question for you, Jonathan. Really enjoyed your talk. Um, amazing where this can go to, to actually see that from, from looking to crystals and then taking it on, that you can actually start to predict what sort of mechanisms and things. And also that link into um, technology. So how, how would you make the leap from from the amazing sort of theory and, and thinking and to be able to talk to the public about the amazing work that you're you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, well I mean I think technology I mean technology isn't standing still as we I mean as you know as I think as we know. I mean you know uh, the in my life I mean <laughs> to put it into perspective Nikki like when I started to learn crystallography, we had to literally mount the crystals on what we used to call a pin and then physically walk into the hutch, put them on the beam, check everything was okay, leave the hutch. And, that the th and, and this took so long that we just used to watch. I mean, in those days, DVDs were new. We used to watch movies. It used to take us that long. You can now collect a data set crystallographically literally in seconds. Okay, so, you know, it, it's gone beyond... You know, we talk about AI, I mean, there's technologies such as in the structural biology field which has gone, you know, so quickly, so rapidly that we are living in a time which is allowing us to use what we want to use, which is time resolved. How do I tell the stories? How do we get this sort of information out there? Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess events like this, I mean, eventually, hopefully, this will be in textbooks so students can find out about it, the general public. I mean... You know, we have outreach activities, I guess. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I mean, I don't really know. I don't know wh where to go and what to say. But yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, my collaborators, I mean, we have a fantastic facility in the UK called Diamond Light Source, okay? And it's not just for life sciences. It's for the physical sciences as well. It is a, it's a phenomenal resource. And what's important is, is that the message continuously gets out there that, yeah, it needs funding. You know, the government's... Any government, not just the present government, probably the next government, the next government, that it needs continuous funding. And to drive science in the UK is a major problem at the moment because the funding stream is drying up and it's getting less and less and less. You know, many of us are sitting here with grants pending, you know, and we pretty much know we're not going to get them. You know, that's where we've got to, unfortunately. I don't want to put a pessimistic view on this, but, you know, you're asking me, and this is where I'm going. I can see Graham sitting in the back there. He may have a different, a different view on this, but it's true. I think it's... so. So we've got to, you know, we've got to keep the science, the quality of science in the UK. We've got to get the message across that we are doing great work. Maria does that, Essex does that, I think. We do do great science at Essex. We've just got to make sure that we keep getting that message across. Yeah. 
Well, eventually it will do, but, you know, to be able to do that, you have to do it at a fundamental level, okay? So, you know, drug discovery companies, they want to look at, you know, how, dr they, you know, they know drugs bind to enzymes, right? But that's just the beginning. How is the drug activated? You know, to be able to visualize that. Computation can do that, but coupled with experiments, if you like, and then couple that with computation, then you get a much richer, much more enriched picture of what you can and cannot, what you can see and what you can aspire to. Yes, um, I'm conscious of time, <laughs> and we have a drinks reception waiting for us. So I just wanted to let you know that our next professorial inaugural lectures will take place on Tuesday, the 27th of February when professors from our Department of Psychosocial and Psychoanalytic Studies will offer insights into their research. But I, I, I wanted to ask you to join me in thanking all of our professors here tonight for giving such inspired talks, being very engaging, and if you're wonder wondering how to write a narrative, ChatGBT can do that for you. Thank you all for attending. And we do have a drinks reception, which is going to be held at the Silverad building, which is the building next to the Lakeside Theater building. So uh, lots of colleagues know their way. And we look forward to seeing you there so you can chat to our, chat to our professors and with each other. Thank you very much for coming.